Hello to everyone. Receive a big hug in the Lord. It is such a great joy to be here once again with all of you to enjoy this teaching service, which has brought many blessings to everyone who's present here today, but above all, worldwide, in over 123 countries who watch this live stream. Blessed is the name of the Lord. And today, as always, let this be of great joy, of great blessing to everyone. All we need is to prepare our hearts to truly desire to please God, and God will be in charge of our lives, our minds, our hearts, if we have that great desire to want to please Him and to live by Him and for Him. That's why we're going to pray, and we're going to dedicate this moment, which is by Him and for Him, blessed as our God. God of glory, good Father, great and wonderful Father you are, how can we not give you these moments? How can we not tell you that you are the greatest, mightiest, most wonderful being we have? Without you, we are nothing. But thanks to your mercy, thanks to your power, thanks to your greatness, O oh Lord, today we can congregate not only here in this physical place, but also around the world in our homes, in the different churches where they are watching these live streams, and for all of us to feel that same warmth, that same fire, that same presence of yours, O oh Lord, because you are omnipresent, omniscient, because who is like you, O oh Lord, if you are the greatest, most beautiful and wonderful being, our greatest treasure, how can we not love you? How can we not follow you? How can we not ask you, Lord, for mercy, if you are generous, good, great, and mighty. That's why on a day such as today, receive this service and let there be blessings for everyone in the name of Christ. Amen and amen. Today, especially you, a first-time guest, or you as a newcomer in the church, you will live all types of experiences. Many People have told us testimonies how they have desired to seek our sister Maria Luisa and to find a sermon such as this one and how they begin to listen to her and they begin to cry. Whenever she prays, so many miracles and wonders and signs have happened worldwide that many people desire to have her visit them for our sister to be there with them. But thanks to technology... Today we have this great blessing. That's why it's so important to believe, to value whenever we pray, whenever we're preaching, that those words may reach our hearts. Isn't that so, brothers and sisters? And let us read in Isaiah 55, thinking about you, you who have had the desire to seek God in many different places, you who have had the desire to seek God in many different ways, and today you have the opportunity to know the God of the Bible, the God who speaks, the God who lives, the God who is able to transform us, to change us, and to make us feel such different things, and to make us feel so special. Because the ideal thing is for us to be children, sons and daughters of God, blessed as our God. And what is happening in this moment? So that you may know it. Let me share with you. I want to greet everyone worldwide but especially our brothers and sisters in Africa. This week, or last week, we visited the country Equatorial Guinea, and over 100 believers gathered. People were very happy, very joyful, sharing testimonies about how through these sermons or through the Bible studies, when our beloved sister Mary Luisa prays, that miracles and wonders happen, how they have learned to pray, to cry out to the Father in the name of the Son. And God has taken action in their lives and blessed them. And this week, we also visited Cameroon, Chad, Benin, Pointe Noir. And now we only have Republic of the Congo left. So about six countries in Africa. Well, welcome. May God bless you. And may God bless this beautiful continent and all of those willing hearts for God. Receive a warm greeting we love you and let us press on. We must believe 
And that is why the Bible states here in Isaiah 55, verse number 1 and onward. We're going to read Isaiah 55, verse 1. Notice how beautiful this is. You who want to see God, you who have been seeking Him worldwide. It doesn't matter where you have congregated before. God promised to bring one by one and two by two all of those who have a sincere heart. And today, we are thousands. Blessed is our God. It states here, Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. What else does it say? Verse 2, let us all read it. Why do you spend and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. And eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. So notice how important this is. Verse 3, incline your ear and come to me here, and your soul shall what? Shall live. Meaning we shall have hope, a desire to live, to fight, to press on. And what else does it say? And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Verse number four, what does it say? Indeed, surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for He has glorified you. Verse six, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man, what? His thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And what else? And to our God, for he will what? Abundantly pardon. Blessed is our God. And lastly, God gives us great advice. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Blessed is our God. And welcome to this beautiful path. You may be seated. And welcome to this path of peace, of joy, of happiness. If we value, if we trust, if we believe in Him, blessed is our God. Let us sing hymns for the glory and the honor of God. We're going to sing hymn 204, which is titled, Burst into Songs of Joy. And who are those who burst into songs of joy? Those who thirst, who have learned to buy milk and honey. Those who have learned to buy everything that God offers us, that wine, that milk, the ability to be saved the ability to have joy, peace, happiness, believing and valuing this wonderful God who is infinitely merciful. Glory to God. Let us sing this hymn, hymn 204.
perfect peace, love eternal, life Jesus made us free. So bright and fair Blessed be our God And what a blessing to be a sheep of the Lord What a blessing to obey God What a blessing to be able to understand and value this path It is a privilege It's not for everyone It is for all of you For each and every one of us Glory to our God Let us also sing hymn 240, Sweeter as the Years Go By. Hymn 240. to our God and look at this beautiful phrase from uh, one of the hymns of uh, the last 
CD number 11, Jesus' love is sweeter as the years go by. And that is the God that you are going to find. A God who is jealous, but also a God who is full of love and mercy. Who is always going to lend us a hand. Who is always going to give us victory. Blessed be our God. That's why we invite all of you who are watching the live streams to look at this tutorial that is going to appear at the bottom of your screens where you can look and enter the website of our church. Those of you who are watching, here we have the website www.idmji.org forward slash en or our YouTube channels. So you can always be up to date with the sermons, the Bible studies and testimonies. And I would like to share a testimony. Several months ago, the Lord allowed us to be, for example, in the area of Europe. And over there, just like here, here in the United States, there is a migration problem. And it's becoming pretty critical and it's collapsing and there have been many problems. But I want to summarize a testimony that I thought was very beautiful about a woman who was in Colombia. And God promised her that she was going to travel abroad. But God told her, but you will have difficulties. And in the last moment, I will manifest myself and you will see my glory and my power. She said that she traveled, and when she traveled, she says that when she reached immigration, they told her, come over here to this room. Most of us know, those of us who have traveled, that if they're sending us to a room, it's because usually they wanna, they're want to they going to send you back. And there were about 150 other people there, and among them, about 80 Colombians that had traveled with her, they were all detained there. Finally, the... The immigration officer said, all of you are going to be going back to your countries tomorrow. She said, but God, what about my promise? What you promised me, Lord. But in the end, she began to pray. And she lasted the whole night with 150 other people there. The next day in the morning, the immigration officers got there and said, let's go. And I'm talking about in uh, Madrid in the airport of Barajas in Spain. And they said, let's go. The plane is ready. We're going to send you back. Everybody start walking. And let's go towards the gate, towards the boarding gates. And she said they all began to walk. And when she was walking, she started walking slower and slower. And she kind of stayed behind to be the last person. And they all started walking through that, that tunnel that leads you to the plane. But she was last. And at the end, when she was about to enter that tunnel a policeman said and she said lady you were going to stay here and she said no i'm only staying here for some time look look at my ticket i'm going back in two and a half months i didn't come here to stay i just came here to accompany my daughter i'm only going to be here for something specific and i know i have to go back and he said oh everybody says the same thing they buy the uh, two-way ticket but they stay here and we are tired of so many immigrants here so that's why you got to go back and she said, but look, but sir, I'm telling you the truth. I don't want to go back. I'm only staying here for two and a half months. Believe me. And, and the man said, this, this officer said, okay, fine. Open your purse. And she opened the purse. And what do you have in your purse? And she said, look at what I have. So she had, she had her Bible, the hymnal, a wallet, and her passport. And the officer said, show me, show me the hymnal again. And he said, ma'am. I cannot deport you. And she said, oh, really? Why? Is it because I also attend that church? Amen. Glory to our God. Blessed is our God. Let us stand. We are going to give the glory to our God. We're going to give thanks to God. And you can find many testimonies on the webpage of the church. You're going to find many testimonies that nourish us of incredible things and that's where we see the manifestation and the power. And what a church that we're in. What a great blessing. This great calling that God has given us. Blessed is our God. Let us pray and let us give the glory to God. And let us say to him, Lord, you're great and mighty. Thank you, Lord, because you surprise us with each passing day. You have captivated us. You have made us fall in love with you. You are the one in charge of our lives. You are the one in charge of everything. In our daily life, 
How can we not thank you? How can we not strive to live better before your presence? That is why, O oh Lord, that you may also receive our tithes and offerings. It is an act of generosity towards you, knowing that tithes is the tenth part of what we earn, what we find, what we are gifted. And an offering is an act of generosity towards you. Lord, receive this act in the name of Christ. Amen and amen. Let us sing chorus number 127, Advocate with the Father. And what a great advocate we have. Isn't that so? He gets us out of so many situations. He, We see that power, that manifestation always in our lives. Glory to our God. Let us sing this chorus, chorus 127. Glory to our God. Likewise, let us sing, lastly, chorus number 80, praise the Lord. And does he deserve for us to praise him? For us to glorify him? For us to live by him and for him? But we must walk in straight paths, fulfilling the gospel, being doers of the word of God, because his word is powerful and good. Amen, brothers and sisters. Let us sing. This course, course number 80. Glory be to our God. And the long-awaited moment has come. Let us welcome our beloved sister Maria Luisa. And as the church, as the children of God, 
Let us offer her our acknowledgement as a woman of God. May God bless you all. May my God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you all today and pour his blessings as the Lord always does, as our God Almighty has always done. We feel so proud of having known this great God. How proud do we feel of having come out of ignorance, out of deceit and lies, when they would teach us and present to us gods that were dead. But today we are enjoying of this living God of power, the Lord of heaven and earth, the creator and the owner of the universe. We ought to honor him, Follow him with all of our hearts. Obey and keep his commandments. To fulfill all of the commandments to please our God. To remove from our lives many things, many weaknesses and mistakes, and perhaps things that we may find small, but destroy spiritual lives. And God turns away from us when we are moved by these tendencies from the flesh that are sinful. We sometimes allow ourselves to be moved by selfishness, greed, covetousness. We are moved by envy. We want everything for ourselves. We want everything for ourselves. We take away from other people what belongs to them, because there is greed, there is covetousness, avarice. And those are the sins that mostly abound in the lives of people, in the midst of daily life, and in the midst of people's roles, neighbors, family members, relatives, university, work, companies, small businesses, In any role, there is an abundance of these sins that people believe are small, that they are simple, but they are the sins that harm spiritual lives the most. That is why we ought to always read the Bible because in the entire Bible we find that God admonishes us and teaches us to turn away from all of these things, from all of these small sins as people call them, Because this is what harms the most and God turns away from us and he takes away our blessings. And this is why we ought to strive to learn and to have this in our being. Being aware and reviewing continuously, reflecting and reviewing our lives, looking at what we need to correct. And if we can't, pray and ask God to help us to remove these things that harm our spiritual life. That is our continuous fight every day of our lives. To pray and ask for all of these things that humans call small, but you cannot see. No one can perceive it, but God can, and he turns away and ignores us. Very well. Today, you may be seated. I would like to give a very warm greeting to all first-time guests newcomers that are also watching the sermon. A very warm greeting to you all, to all of those people who live in faraway remote countries that makes it difficult to watch the sermon because their internet may not reach every place. And when they have the opportunity, they are very happy. 
listening and watching the sermon, and I know that God, with His mercy and love, seeing the effort made by people, the Lord manifests Himself greatly among everyone. Therefore, a greeting to all, and for first-time guests and newcomers, I invite you to have a Bible, read the Bible, and if you do not know what to read, for example, in the Bible there are Psalms, which are songs of praise to God, prayers to God. You can read and speak to God. Ask God many things, and if you do it from your heart, then God is going to answer you. He is going to reply. The Lord is always attentive to the prayers and pleas of any human being. In a psalm, it says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. Call upon me in the day of need. On the day of tribulation. Call upon me. And I will be attentive, and I will listen, and I will answer, the Lord says. What a wonderful promise. Thanks be to our God for this. We give thanks to God. And today we are going to read, As I have been saying to all first-time guests and newcomers, we are reading the Acts of the Apostles. And today we are going to read chapter 21 which we are going to read from verse 1 to 40. A wonderful story where the experiences or the occurrences of the apostles are told from the first disciples. The first apostles that God formed and he ordered them to begin and start the Church of the Lord, the evangelizing work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are delighting ourselves, we have been delighting ourselves, in these Acts of the Apostles, and we are up to chapter 21. We are finishing up this wonderful story where we have found many things that we live today. We have lived them. And the way that God manifests himself, that for us is nothing new, because we have also experienced it, and this fills us with pride. We are filled with joy, because we see how God lives. And God speaks today. Blessed is the Lord. And it says, in Acts 22 it says, In this narration that we have been looking at, we are seeing Paul's journey with other disciples and they were visiting many different cities. They traveled through the Mediterranean Sea by boat and that is how they were able to make it to places, to towns, islands and they preached the word of the Lord. They were persecuted, they took them to prison or they would whip them. Well, a lot happened to the apostles. And here also in chapter 21, it says, Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them, Paul is referring to all of his disciples, a group that was with him, they traveled with him. He says, When we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos, the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. And finding a ship, sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Here we see how they were in their voyage, in their journey, and yet you can see that they constantly were praying to God, praising God, and the Holy Spirit was speaking to them, leading them, guiding them, and telling them the things that they needed to do and how they had to do it. The Holy Spirit was always there leading the group. 
a fulfillment of the word of the Lord Jesus Christ when he said, I am leaving and I am sending the Holy Spirit to be with you, with all of you. And he is going to guide you and teach you and tell you everything that you ought to do. What a wonderful promise fulfilled here with the apostles and also with us today. Thanks be to our God for this. In verse 5 it says, it says here that the Holy Spirit spoke to Paul telling him not to go to Jerusalem. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. Here we see, well, we imagine, they are at the shore, they kneel to pray to God, because they didn't have another place to do it. And the circumstance forced them to do this prayer on the shore. I remember that the first time that I went to Italy, there were two sisters or three sisters the church had not yet formed in Europe. That time we traveled there as a trip, but there were three sisters that lived, or a sister that lived in Italy in Rome. And she, when we traveled, we let her know that we were going there. And she said, I want to see you. Visit me. And well, we went there. And we met at the train station. She was there waiting for us at the train station since she worked in a house where she was the only one who could enter the house because she was hired to do the chores of the house. There was no other place to pray, but she brought two other people, other three people, and there in the station, in a corner on a side, we prayed and I gave them prophecy. I gave them prophecy, and from that moment on, the word of the Lord, the seed was sowed, and the church was formed there in Rome. Thanks be to the Lord, because we needed to pray. I wasn't going to... I wasn't going to wait around if there wasn't a special place that I wasn't going to pray for the sister and the people she brought. We prayed there and the Lord spoke to them. That is to serve God and to do things with wisdom. And today, if we today, I have seen and I know of some congregations that are used to going to shopping centers, to malls, to stores, markets, whatever you may call them. And they go where everyone is and they go there and they begin to pray for people and people are in a restaurant or a cafe sitting down and they get there and they say, come here, I'll give you prophecy, I'll pray over you, I'll give you revelations. That is called being imprudent because we now have a special place. We have special locations and we would act imprudently if we are at that market or that place where people are having fun or they are eating or they are shopping and you bother people. By speaking to them, come, let me lay hands on you, let me prophesy to you in front of everybody. That is not done today. Because at the beginning, in order to sow the word of the Lord, since there was no place and no one knew the word of the Lord, we needed to pray in season and out of season. And wherever it was necessary, we needed to do it. We need to act wisely in order to do these things. It isn't at every moment and at every time that we need to do these things because then it will look bad. People will see that badly. People are going to mock and criticize. And you would just give them a card, tell them to visit the church. This is the address. Go there. This is the closest church. I invite you so that you can go and God will speak to you. 
But if the person says, I can't go, then I invite you to my house. Come to my house. And I would like for you to pray for me and lay hands on me. And you could possibly do this as well. But be very careful. Because not every city or towns or countries are safe places. So we need to be very careful because we may meet people who have bad intentions to harm you or to harm the brother or sister who is speaking to them. That is why we ought to do things wisely and examine the lay of the land, as people say, prior to accept the invitation that someone gives of going to their house and praying for them. So since I don't know people, and since today there is a lot of uncertainty in every aspect, we invite them to go to church. That would be the prudent thing to do. Meanwhile, at this time when they said that they prayed on the shore, they did it because they didn't have anywhere else to do it. They prayed, the Holy Spirit speaks to them, guides them, and leads them. In my case, where I needed to speak to the sister since I already knew her and she knew me, so I wasn't going to distrust her. She brought three other people and there was no other place because she couldn't take me to her workplace because they wouldn't allow it. There wasn't a place to pray or worship God and she was thirsting for the word of God. That is why I prayed at that train station. On the side, we prayed and I laid hands on them. I gave them prophecy and the church began. After the church begins, and someone lends their living room to be able to gather, and all of this is done wisely. Wisely and not imprudently or with fanaticism, because the Lord has always taught us to not be fanatical, but to be wise and prudent in everything. And we give thanks to God because he teaches us. And so here the apostles, after having prayed at the shore, when we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist. So they had all of the spiritual gifts, the ministries of the Lord. They were all working. They began to work from the very first moment. It says that this Philip, the evangelist, were one of the seven who were chosen to serve the tables and stayed with him. Verse 9 says, Now this Philip had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. But let us highlight these four virgin daughters of Philip. They were prophetesses. So this fills us with joy and enthusiasm because the Lord or the Holy Spirit is speaking through people giving and imparting the wonderful spiritual gifts, which is what we today proclaim. We are always proclaiming that we ought to seek the spiritual gifts, to seek for God to use us and to give us these wonderful gifts to all for the service of the Lord and for this evangelizing work worldwide. This is what we hope, that the Lord may see our need and that he may continue to manifest himself or that he may manifest himself in perfection in our lives. And it says in verse 10, And as we stayed many days in the house of Philip the Evangelist, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him 
into the hands of the Gentiles. Here we see how this prophet, Agabus, proceeded in a very similar way. He proceeded or prophesied just as prophet Isaiah, prophet Ezekiel, or Jeremiah, where when they were going to give a prophecy, they would give an example with objects, with real things, so that people would understand better. And Agabus did the same. He took Paul's belt and he bound himself and he said that the Jews were going to bind the man who owns this belt in Jerusalem. And he didn't want Paul to travel, to not travel. But I remembered while reading verse 11, I remembered that we when we began in this path of the Lord, I remember that Brother Louis Moreno, at that time, he was my husband, we went to sisters who were prophetesses. We went to them continuously, and they were prophetesses, and they belonged, each one belonged to a different evangelical church. But in their churches, they did not allow for them to prophesy because they didn't believe and they would forbid it. And so they would pray and the Holy Spirit would use them. And they were obligated to pray at home in their homes because at church they weren't able to. And the people that knew them would visit them and they would give them revelation from God. And that is how we met these sisters and of course, I wouldn't miss a Saturday and I would go to their house because I loved receiving prophecy. I loved that they would give me revelations. I was happy when God spoke to me. And there were many things that I didn't understand, but the important thing is that God spoke. And so one day, a normal day, we were there praying. One of them, she took Brother Lewis. He was kneeled praying and she made a gesture as if she had taken a cape in her hands. And she saw that there was a cape in her hands and she said, I am placing the cape. And she was doing the gesture on him of putting on a cape and then the sword and putting the sandals on him. She would kneel and tie the sandals and she put on him all of the garments of a prophet. And she was speaking and putting the garments on him, and my eyes were open because I didn't understand. I was new. I was just starting. I was a beginner. So I was watching all of this, and I was astonished and marveled that she was doing all of these gestures of dressing him as a prophet, and she was seeing this in her vision, and that she was taking these objects, and she felt everything physically, but I didn't see anything on her. It was just a gesture, but she actually felt that everything was physical, everything she was grabbing to put on him. And so that experience we have lived. And when I began to read the Bible and to read all of these things, then I realized that it was biblical, that it wasn't something made up by that sister, but it was biblical, that the Lord uses prophets or prophetesses in some occasions for these events. And so all of this fills me with pride, knowing and thinking about those prophets that God used in antiquity, Ezekiel, Isaiah. I say their names because they have the biggest books. But today the Lord has done the same things with us. And so it fills me with pride, knowing that God is real, that God does live. He exists. And since he exists and he is very near to us, he deserves for us to give him our best to honor him. And here, this prophet, Agabus, did this. For me, this is nothing new. I have lived this. I have seen it with my eyes. And so I am not going to be surprised by these things, nor am I going to say, oh, that was just for antiquity. Today, it doesn't happen. No, today, God does the same things. Glory to God. And after he told Paul to not go to Jerusalem, 
because there they were going to bind him and they were going to harm him greatly. Now, when we heard these things, it says in verse 12, now when we heard this prophecy or revelation, both we and those from that place pleaded with him, with Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Glory to our God. He was willing to give his life for the Lord, and he did not pay attention to that revelation that they were going to torture him. Perhaps the Lord knew that that was going to happen, that Paul was going to deny himself and travel to Jerusalem anyway. But God gave that revelation as a testimony to all who were there present to show them that God is powerful, that he exists, that he lives, and that everyone should believe and have conviction and certainty in the Lord since it was the beginning of the preaching of the gospel. God had to manifest himself this way so that when everything was fulfilled, people would believe more. Just as when the Lord today fulfills so many things, we believe him more. Thanks be to our God. And it says here in verse 14, So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain Manasin or Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law, the law of Moses. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs of Moses. These were the accusations against Paul and that he was teaching a different religion. Verse 22. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. The vow that we have spoken about before of the Nazarite. And there were four who had converted to the gospel, but they were going to take a vow. And here they wisely make the decision that these people should fulfill the vow to show the rulers, those who are accusing and persecuting Paul, to show them that they were still fulfilling the law of Moses, that they were not teaching something different. And in verse 24, he says, Take them, those who were going to take a vow, take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. All of this is wisdom, shrewdness, and strategies that they had for what? To save their life and to protect themselves from persecution and punishment. And in verse 25, it says, But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing. So they were saying, the Jews can shave their heads and 
fulfill the requirements of the law. But the Gentiles do not have any right or obligation to fulfill all of the requirements of the law of Moses. That is what they were saying here. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, they should not be forced, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, so eating things sacrificed to idols, from drinking blood, and from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. But that sexual immorality was idolatry in worshipping idols and gods, because at that time, they were used to, thousands of years ago, the way in which they would praise their gods and worship them, they would sleep with women in special cubicles before a statue to have intimate relations because that was the way that they were honoring that God X or God so-and-so. I'm not going to name them because, really, I was never interested in memorizing the names of the idols, their names, but to know more or less what they would practice, but to memorize their names, I'd rather use my time on other things. So they would do these acts, and these acts were fornication. They would fornicate with those women there in the presence of the idol. And here, the apostles, they were saying that the Gentiles should not fulfill the requirements of the law of Moses, but they should abstain from drinking blood, meat from strangled animals, and fornication, which was that idolatry there in these obscene things they would do with their gods, with their statues. In verse 26, it says, Then Paul took the men, in other words, the four Jews who had converted, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, on Paul, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Because he would enter the temple to preach the gospel, and all types of people would enter from different nations. And that is why they were saying that Paul was defiling the temple. Verse 29, For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian, Trophimus the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple. And immediately the doors were shut. There is the fulfillment of the prophecy by Agabus, the prophet Agabus. But Paul knew that that was going to happen, and he did not care about these things. And it says, And immediately the doors were shut. They took him out and shut the doors. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So poor Paul, what God said was fulfilled, but he did it for the love of God. He didn't even feel the pain of those hits because God's love was more powerful over his body and the love of God makes people not feel any agony. And it says in verse 33, Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. 
And some among the multitude cried one thing, and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. In other words, they had to carry him. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, Away with him! Then, as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? He replied, Can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion? Look at what they were accusing him of. All of this was injustice and slander against Paul. He said, Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus. In Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, once they were silent, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, And this is to be continued. Because what follows is the interesting part of the story. But Paul, in his shrewdness, we can see, he said he was a Jew, and later on, in the way he speaks, he convinced those people. But, for us, let's not just say, poor Paul, look at how the disciples suffered. Let's read in Matthew 5. Let's read here, quickly, in Matthew 5. Something that the Lord Jesus Christ warned. He warned the disciples. He warned the apostles. In Matthew 5, many times we've analyzed it and studied it. Many times. Let us read very quickly from verse 1 to verse 5. The Lord Jesus, in his warning to the apostles, when he spoke to them and taught them and gave them orders of what they had to do after him, the Lord says here that he was with the disciples and there was a multitude who were listening to him. And it says in verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them his apostles, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit, those who are humble, meek, modest, with a willing heart to listen to the things of God. That is the poor in spirit. Because the rich in spirit are those who are arrogant and haughty, who believe they know it all and have the world in their hand and the power. Those are the rich in spirit. But these poor, meek, humble, and modest, blessed are they, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ taught this to his apostles. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Therefore, Paul said, I am going to give my life to the Lord. And in his torture and the way that they martyred him, certainly there was a reason for him to cry because of the pain. Perhaps. But it wasn't just mourning of a suffering because of the Lord, but that many people would be persecuted. They would be slandered and insulted. Many people are persecuted to be harmed because of the Word of God, for being a Christian, for reading the Bible, for going to a church. Their family persecute them. They make them suffer. They take away their aid. Well, so many things happen. They are looked down upon. The Apostle Paul said, I will give my life for the Lord. I am going to Jerusalem. And in verse 5, the Lord says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
he said to the apostles. The apostles said, We need to be meek. Also, because we are going to receive eternal life as inheritance. 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And the apostles, We have had hunger and thirst for righteousness, and the Lord is teaching us. And so he will teach us, and one day we will face and preach to people and teach them. And certainly they will persecute us and they will harm us, but God will give us comfort. God will supply all of our needs and also dry our tears. And in 7 it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The apostles began to preach the gospel because in them, in their heart, there was also mercy for a soul, for a being that is lost. And they preached with love, with sincerity, preaching to the souls that were thirsting for the true word of God, thirsting to receive the blessings from God, the healing, the miracle, the wonder and comfort. They did it with that mercy and they taught people that all should do it this way, that we should all be this way as these beatitudes are. We are must practice these things. We must take these verses and apply it to our lives, just as the apostles in the beginning would apply it to their lives. And they worked in the Lord. They worked in the Lord's vineyard, in that vineyard that we are also working in. Glory be to God. And in verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart. The Lord was teaching his apostles, you need to have a pure heart. Do not feel grudge, hate, envy. Do not harm anyone. Be loving, merciful, extend a hand, and be generous. Forgive and love people sincerely. And that is how they learned it from the Lord. And that is how they preached it in the beginning as well. And they left everything and the Holy Spirit continues to teach us today the same way, for us to do the same and for us to feel the same. Blessed is the Lord. 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There the Lord was warning them as well that they were going to be persecuted. For preaching the righteousness of God, but that the kingdom of heaven was of those who were going to suffer that persecution in every aspect. The apostles here enjoyed of the Lord, preached, they were persecuted, but now they are enjoying the kingdom of heaven with the Lord. And we also aspire the same. We are teaching and the enemy persecutes us and harms us, hurts us, makes us sick, gives us illnesses, sends us witchcraft, sorcery, curses to make us suffer. But one day we are going to be in the Lord's kingdom. Verse 11, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. The Lord Jesus was saying all of this to his apostles Look at what you are going to face. You and those who will follow in the coming generations will face. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, the Lord says. At the end, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That is what the Lord said to his apostles. And all of this, they lived here in this book of Acts. We are reading the story of the apostles, the disciples, preaching the word of God and the way in which they were persecuted, tortured, humiliated, 
but glory to our God that they passed, they won the battle, they triumphed, and now they rejoice with our God. And now it's our turn as well to be here. As I said before, the enemy persecutes us by doing all kinds of evil, but one day we will be with the Lord. The invitation to all of you so that you may read the Bible, speak to God, read the Psalms, kneel in your home privately, raise your hands, and cry out to the Lord who created the heavens and earth, to that God who was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with Moses, that almighty God that was with his apostles and left this wonderful teaching and warned them of what would happen to them in the future, to that God that promised us the Holy Spirit, and to this day the Holy Spirit is with us, blessed is the name of the Lord. Seek God, trust and believe in him, and you will see that you also will partake of the kingdom of heaven. Let us pray. Holy Father, Heavenly Father, thank you, everlasting God. Thank you, Lord, creator of the heavens and the earth. Our almighty God, who was in the Garden of Eden, You spoke to Adam, and you gave him many instructions. Then you manifested yourself to humans. And generation after generation, you walked with every one of those who prepared their hearts for you. And we today, after thousands of years, we are also hearing about your name, about your word, about the manifestation of your Holy Spirit, because we read about it in the Bible, and because we began to seek and ask you to give us those experiences that were written in the Bible. We wanted to enjoy of those experiences and live them, and you have given us these wishes You have given us your Holy Spirit, and you want to give the Holy Spirit to all beings and give the spiritual gifts and use each person to manifest yourself so that many may be prophets, so that many may be evangelists, pastors, teachers, so that many may have the spiritual gifts and serve you, Lord. And this way, you will offer them the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. And now, in your mercy and love, we ask that you extend your almighty healing hand upon all people who are sick and upon those people also who suffer from evil spirits, from dementia, demons that come and possess their bodies. They do not allow them to reason or function as human beings, and they suffer. Lord, extend your healing hand. Heal material, physical, and mental illnesses, and remove all witchcraft and sorcery and all curses. Protect and keep us from all of this evil, that your almighty hand may be blessing everyone. Work miracles and wonders. Remove doubt. Remove unbelief. Give faith to each person. In the heart of each person, dwell and abide in each person's heart. Lord, in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, we ask for it all. Blessed is the Lord. Praised is the name of our God. Let us sing to the Lord that chorus. Chorus 157, From Captivity. From Captivity. De cautividad, de cautividad, Dios 
Dios nos hizo volver de cautividad, de cautividad, Dios nos hizo volver. Hay risas y danzas y alabanzas porque Él nos hizo volver. Hay risas y danzas y alabanzas porque Él nos hizo volver. De cautividad, de cautividad, Dios nos hizo volver. De cautividad, de cautividad, Dios nos hizo volver. Hay risas y danzas y alabanzas porque Él nos hizo volver. Hay risas y danzas y alabanzas porque Él nos hizo volver. Glory to our God. Thanks be to our Heavenly Father. The honors for our God. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. Thank you all. May my God bless you. I send you a big hug. And for the children, the kiss as usual. May my God bless you all. See you soon. Thank you very much.